Wyoming like America used to be. It don't get no better. Wyoming is wide open spaces, 98,000 square miles of it, about a quarter square mile for each of its 493,000 inhabitants. In Wyoming, cattle outnumber the people nearly three to one. This is the cowboy state. When cowboys aren't working, this is what they do for fun and sport, rodeo. And one of the first rodeos of the summer is in Jackson Hole, Wyoming on Memorial Day weekend. Bull riding is the first event in this rodeo. It's a tough, sometimes dangerous way to make a living. Behind the scenes, you get a feel for these unique and remarkably rugged, tough and very determined young athletes. The required eight-second ride can be an eternity. Then getting off and out of harm's way, equally exciting. Saddle and bareback bronc riding are the most popular events. Each rider must stay on his mount for the prescribed eight seconds. Presuming he does so, 50% of his score will depend on his performance, the remaining 50% on how well the horse bucks. If the cowboy touches anything with his free hand, it's an immediate disqualification. Do everything right and get a good bucking horse, he may win the purse for that event. So you seem to be wearing a lot of white. I'm old. <laughs> 30. 15 years of riding bucking horses. I got a couple injuries. But it's a good life. Rodeo began as a way cowboys could test the skills they use in their day-to-day -day business of working cattle. Kids grow up, you know, and they... They get into basketball or football or tennis or lacrosse or soccer or something like that. Here we grow up with rodeo. It's what we do. It's part of the, our heritage. It's part of uh, the way we make a living, a lot of us. And so, you know, it's not, uh, it's not, it's for fun. But they're honed skills that come in handy in a cowboy's profession, whether it's roping or riding colts. You know, got a little snot in them, should we say. They buck with you on occasion. Well, you got to be able to get by them and still get your work done. That's where rodeo originally started. You know? It's done every day outside of the arena in the state of Wyoming. And that's why I say Wyoming, like America used to be. To many, Wyoming may be the cowboy state. To others, the equality state has more significance. On the other side of the state, in Cheyenne, the capital, Wyoming state treasurer, Cynthia Lummis. So Wyoming is the first government in the world to grant women the right to vote. Uh, that happened in uh, 1870. A woman named Louisa Swain cast the first ballot uh, in Laramie, Wyoming, and uh, Wyoming has continuously since that time uh, granted women the right to vote. And so even though the Constitution was amended, I believe, in about, the 19, in, in about 1920, uh, we beat that by 50 years. 
Wyoming had the uh, first woman governor of any state, Nellie Taylor Ross, in the late 1920s. Uh, she succeeded her husband in office, who had died, and then ran for re-election and was defeated. Uh, but she still did serve as governor, uh, filling out his unexpired term. Uh, we currently have uh, the first woman uh, president of our state senate, so that took a much longer time. April Brimmer Coons is her name. She's from uh, Laramie County from here in Cheyenne. Uh, a woman named Verda James from Casper was our first woman uh, Speaker of the House. Uh, we currently have our first woman on the Supreme Court here in Wyoming, so lots of states beat us to that. Uh, her name is Marilyn Kite. Okay. Esther Hobart Morris was very significant in women's suffrage, uh, first woman justice of the peace, we also had here in Wyoming the first woman bailiff and the first woman to be subpoenaed to serve on a jury. Uh, all those women were based in Laramie, Wyoming as well. What is it about Laramie, Wyoming that brings the women out from cover? I don't know if it was because uh, there were uh, uh, lots of educators in Laramie uh, or uh, whether there was just a shortage of men <laughs> in Laramie that caused it to be so active in uh, uh, women's suffrage, uh, but that was a hotbed of uh, women firsts in Wyoming. In Jackson, Wyoming, Jackson Hole had the first all-woman city council, uh, and that has an interesting story behind it as well. So what were the men doing while the women were running for office? I don't know if they were uh, ranching, banking, uh, or, or engaged in some other activity to build the the state, uh, but uh, uh, there were so few people in Wyoming that it took literally everyone uh, to make it function well. Basically, while the men were out taming the West, in many cases, the women were running it. Just outside Jackson Hole, Wyoming, a drive that has been described by many as the prettiest in the United States, Highway 89 runs along Jackson Lake and the Grand Teton Mountain Range. The proximity of the Jackson Hole Valley to a vast expanse of wilderness puts nature literally at the community's doorstep. The National Elk Refuge is within the city limits. Full of elk over the winter, the herds are now migrating to higher elevations, with some lingering behind for the easy grazing on lower pasture land. The town of Jackson has developed a bit of a split personality in recent years. On the one hand, it's become a retreat for the rich and famous, driving property values into the stratosphere. On the other, it's a world-class outdoor recreation and tourism destination. Tourism and catering to the public is big, big business here. Chairlifts, jammed with skiers in the winter, transform the sightseeing trips to the mountaintops in the summer. Jackson seems to have found a balance in handling the needs of the glitterati and the tourists. For all, Jackson's Old West Days celebration is how the community initiates the summer season. Every now and then these things get a little feisty. We do have some, uh, we do have some entries in the parade where they fire guns, and that makes the horses a little more energetic. Like that. That was not a horse.
everyone loves a parade, particularly in bright, sunny, 75-degree weather. Jackson builds their Memorial Day event as one of the last and best horse-drawn parades in the West. Now, if you join these folks for dinner, you will see those guys with the first three horses again. Everything Western is the theme here, including a contest for horse-drawn carriages. This is, um, it's a cones course, so you're just driving through cones, and in the first class, we guess our own time, and then the next class is a flat-out race, so it's based on time. Driving the big Clydesdale Jake. <laughs> <laughs> through an obstacle course. Through an obstacle course, actually, yes. Through the cones are only maybe six inches wider than the wheelbase on this, on each side, maybe. And how old is Jake? Jake's 19 years old. He came, he came from Dubois, Wyoming, from the Turtle Ranch. Celebration is a task Jackson takes seriously. Chuck wagon style dinners and entertainment are popular here. At the Bar J Chuck Wagon, good food and classic Old West humor and entertainment with the Bar J Wranglers. We're going to loosen our vocal cords right now with an old song that uh, we love to sing, and it's a classic. Oh, give me a home where the concept originated uh, we, we were doing trail rides and uh, we'd take kids out for trail rides and bring them back uh, around a campfire and un unload the horses and and serve them a supper and then sing a few songs around the campfire to them the old old cowboy songs old traditional songs sons of the pioneer style music and uh, when uh, when we started noticing that People would come up and drop their kids off for the horseback rides, and then they would make sure to bring Ma and Pa out and Grandma to come out and get supper and watch the cowboys sing at night. We had fewer and fewer people riding, and more and more of them having supper and show, so we sold the horses and went to cooking. A little bit of everything. <laughs> when you eat tonight, hurry up and eat, because i got to wash your dishes, too. We uh, strive real hard to just keep a real genuine atmosphere out here. We're not trying to be something we're not. We get up there and... and we work hard on, on the show, on the harmonies, and uh, I feel like uh, that's something Dad instilled in us. He, he was teaching us to sing harmonies just as little kids growing up, so we kind of have that in, in the back of our mind all the time, and we kind of have a new audience every night, so we have a good, fresh show every night, and uh, we do run this seven nights a week all summer long. We run from uh, Memorial Day weekend clear through September. Cowboys have a lot of time to themselves as they work on the ranch. An entire art form unique to the American West has developed as a result of that free time. Cowboy uh, poetry. Uh, for she was here, and if I'd have been a drinking man, now would have been the time to have a beer. But <laughs> instead, I backed the trailer up to that bowl. I had a plan of action. Told it straight to my wife. I was waiting for her reaction. Crawl up in that trailer, honey. <laughs> now is the time to use the bait. <laughs> Wave your arms and make some noise. When he starts chasing you, come out the side gate. <laughs> to my surprise, she crawled, crawled right in. I didn't have to shove. I feel no regrets. I never cheated no man, and I hope that paid my debts. I never traveled around the world. I never did a lot of things, but I lived here in the West, seen her mountains, lakes, and streams. 
oh, I guess there's some things that I should have done, but it's too late to start now, and I would have missed a lot of fun. But I thank the good Lord every day for making me what I am. I've probably seen more treasures than the richest man. When my days are over and life has passed me by, don't feel no sorrow for me. Don't break down and cry. Just get my horse and saddle and take us out on the range. Tie my feet to the stirrups. Let my hands hold the reins. Then point us off towards the west. Give the horse a little slack. Say a few words for me, then slap him on the back, and I'll just ride off into the sunset one last time. Thank you. Just outside Jackson a few miles, cowboys of another persuasion. Kayak surfing, where you get a wave, like you see there, and the design of the boat is to stay on the wave and do spins, tricks, these days, you can actually lift a boat off the water and do what's called an aerial move. You can do blunts, helixes, all kinds of different moves. The wave's a little bit flat today, so it's going to be tough to actually launch the boat off the water. But uh, it's a great surf. It just feels good out there having the water rush beneath your boat. Especially having the sun beat down on you. You can't beat that. Wyoming has a long history of firsts. This magnificent piece of real estate, Yellowstone Park, over 3,000 square miles of it, became the nation's first national park in 1872. When President Theodore Roosevelt dedicated the arch at the north entrance to the park in 1903, he defined the park's significance. Yellowstone Park is something absolutely unique in the world. Nowhere else in any civilized country is there to be found such a tract of veritable wonderland made accessible to all visitors. By the late 40s, President Roosevelt's words rang even more true as accessibility to the park's wonder became available to wider and wider segments of the economic strata of society. Yellowstone is the world's first national park. It has a majority of the world's uh, thermal features, including geysers, hot springs, mud pots, and fumaroles. It has, uh, it's the largest essentially intact uh, temperate ecosystem in the lower 48 states. We have geysers, hot springs, mud pots, and fumaroles. Geysers have a plumbing system with reservoirs of water and constrictions that build up pressure and the water is released in an eruption. Mud pots have the um, gases that combine with the moisture underneath the surface and create an acidic solution that dissolves the rock and creates mud. And they blurp and plop and make all kinds of fun noises and little um, mini volcanoes in the uh, mud pots. We have hot springs that, where the water circulates freely and creates beautiful pools of water, blues, greens, and then the runoff channels support bacteria life, which you get the yellow and orange rays that uh, extend beyond the uh, boundaries of the hot springs. And we have uh, fumaroles. 
which has less water but a lot of heat, and so you get that hissing, uh, loud uh, noise of steam being released from the ground. Old Faithful is one of the largest, uh, most regular and predictable geysers in the world. It, uh, it erupts to heights of 106 to 184 feet, uh, still as high as it's almost ever been, and uh, it erupts on an average of every 94 minutes. It is very predictable. We predict it by timing the duration of the eruption. Uh, if it's longer than two and a half minutes, it's 94 minutes wait till the next eruption. If it's under two and a half minutes long, then it's a 65 minute wait till the next eruption. It erupts because we're in a special place here in Yellowstone. We have, we're very close to a source of magma or partially molten rock that supplies the heat. And because of our volcanic eruptions, we have a lot of rhyolite here, which is rich in silica, a glass-like mineral that helps to create a pressure tight seal around the cracks and fissures in the ground. And um, Old Faithful also has a constriction. They lowered a camera into Old Faithful. About 22 feet down, there's a four and an eighth inch opening where all that water um, has to come out. And the, the water sitting on top of that constriction builds up pressure, like putting a lid on a pressure cooker. And when a little bit of pressure is released, that water can expand and be forced out in an eruption. They've dated the water that, has come, that comes out of the geysers and they've discovered that it's ancient water. The time that it fell as rain or snow percolated through the surface, reached down close to uh, be heated by that partially molten magma, um, and then, uh, the, then come up back through the surface of the earth, takes about 500 years. So we can imagine that the water we see erupt out of Old Faithful maybe fell as rain or snow when Columbus was exploring the New World. Elk, bison, along with a wide variety of bird life, are easy to find near the road in a number of locations in the park. Bear and wolves are another story. But with sufficient time, a visitor may be lucky enough to catch sight of one or the other. The wildlife is another thing that attracts people to Yellowstone. Uh, we have wild herds of bison. We have bears. Uh, get lots of questions about where to see bears. Uh, wolves that were reintroduced into Yellowstone in 1995. And a whole host of other wildlife that really captures uh, visitors' attention. And speaking of visitors, how many visitors do you get in an average year? About up to three million. Is it difficult to have three million visitors and all the wildlife all in the same geographical area? Uh, sometimes it presents challenges, uh, people that want to get a close-up photograph. Uh, we ask people to stay 25 yards from wildlife for their safety, 100 yards from bears or the length of a football field. And every, it's almost every year we see um, accidents of people that have gotten too close or tried to feed the wildlife. Right now, a lot of people are being stopped by the herds of bison walking in the road. We call them bear jams, bison jams, um, and it, whatever's stopping traffic at that moment. And most people don't mind wa waiting for the bison. It's a pretty spectacular experience um, to not have to be caught in a traffic jam bumper to bumper because of traffic, but because of wildlife walking right by your car. Our bison, we have about 3,500 bison in the park. Right now they're calving, so you'll see a lot of the cinnamon calves running and jumping around with the herd. Uh, bison can weigh up to a ton, uh, so you'll see those big bulls that uh, weigh almost 2,000 pounds. They can run faster than a horse for short distances. They can jump six-foot fences at a near standstill. They can turn on a dime. They look incredibly slow, just like a domestic cow, but they're fast and unpredictable, and that's what gets a lot of people into trouble. 
There are estimates of uh, 13 to 30,000 elk that use the park during the summertime. Uh, they do migrate to lower elevations outside of the park in the winter time. And they can be seen now, the males are starting to grow their uh, antlers, so you'll see velvet covering their antlers. Uh, that supplies blood and, and helps them to grow. They don't keep their antlers all year. They uh, drop them uh, in the winter time, late winter, and they start regrowing them, and they can grow up to two inches in a month. On the Wind River, a couple of hours east of Jackson, a unique community has evolved from an old west cow town. Du Bois is the epitome of Wyoming lifestyle and values where outdoor recreation, hunting and fishing is a way of life. As spring runoff begins to subside, residents and visitors are on the creeks and rivers, working out adrift with a new fly pattern and exploring pools that may have changed from last season. Du Bois artist and fly fishing guide, Leon Sanderson on Wyoming. It's untouched. It, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world that hasn't been spoiled yet. We've got, I don't know how many mountain streams and lakes and ponds and places to fish and do the outdoor activities that don't have people involved. We've just, it's absolute paradise, it really is. And I shouldn't say that either. Fishing's terrible. Um, it's nothing but white fish and dinks on the Rend River and we stick to that story as much as we can. And the fishing's phenomenal. Um, can't find a better place to fish for the amount of people involved. When he's not on the river, he can be found at the Velvet Thorn Gallery in Du Bois, which he shares with artist and partner, Jill Judd. Most of our work's commissioned work, um, custom, you name it, anything to do with wood, um, basically sculpted wood, be it furniture, fireplace, mantles, doors, um, the flag, you know, um, custom furniture of all kinds, headboards for beds, that kind of thing. Jill does a, a, a really special thing with the wood where she uses a paint as a stain and then sets it with a glaze over the top of that and then the finishes just turn out beautiful. So it's, it's kind of a different product than most sculpted work. It's not the harsh um, chip carve type thing that you would normally see. It's, uh, we sand primarily with abrasives and we work our wood to a point where it almost looks like driftwood. It's been worked so much, and that really makes the finish pretty special. That's one of our bear doors. We've done quite a few bear doors. You can see the style there. I mean, there's a lot of detail you can't see until you get it actually in the right light. This door changes considerably in different light. But it almost disappears in direct light. It takes side light for it to really show up. So it changes considerably. In the evenings, it's beautiful. What we're really looking for is that you always see the wood and the beauty of the wood over or is equal to the sculpting. You don't get tired of wood. You don't get tired of wood. It's gorgeous. For whatever reason, Du Bois seems to attract a lot of artists and artisans. There's a cowboy named Rob who spends his time restoring old sheep herders' wagons to a state of beauty and comfort a sheep herder would never recognize. He basically takes the wagon down to the frame and rebuilds it piece by piece, using whenever possible original parts. He does take a little license here and there, but that's part of the fun in taking what was virtually a piece of junk and turning it into a beautiful, useful wagon. They were invented in the uh, uh, late 1800s by a guy in uh, Rollins, Wyoming. And this old boy invented those wagons for sheep herders to live in out on the prairie and they stayed in them year round. Blizzards, uh, the summer, the whole, the whole year round and they got a little cook stove in them and pretty tough guys they were uh, pretty brutal so 
they were kind of the first uh, motor home, really. I'm going to park them in the yard, and when I'm old and sick, since we have no stocks, bonds, savings accounts, or any things like that, we'll rent them out to fishermen, you see. So that's the plan. That's the plan on it. But it takes about a year and a half to build one. And Leon Sanderson's been a big, big help with the visions and the ideas that we come up with, because I can cut a board, but he's the artist, you know. So between him and I, and as long as I don't run out of money, uh, I think we got her made. <laughs> we'll probably crank out a couple more. <laughs> so, and then that'll be it. Yard's getting full, <laughs> you know. Joe and Jean Brandle are another couple who have combined their love of the outdoors, art, and business. Their shop, Absaroka Western Designs and Tannery, is just a block or so up the road. One of their specialties is tanning the various hides brought in over the winter from hunters all over the state. A uniquely Western phenomenon, they are considered one of the very best hair on tanners in the country, combining a variety of techniques both old and new. Now we gotta try and get this cob out of here. Most remarkably, so. they use only organic, biodegradable components in the process. They create a wide variety of products from animal skins. Damaged animals such as skunk, and, and damaged by the means they'll be in towns and, and they've gotta be uh, eradicated in certain areas and stuff. And rather than throw the carcass away, uh, we can tan the skins for people. And of course, there's no smell anymore left to him. But uh, the old people, you know, an interesting use of this historically is that warriors, man and hidatsas years ago, and you'll see this in paintings of Carl Bodmer, used these for ankle drags. And it was a symbol of a certain uh, society, warrior society, um, that the skunk had. And so sometimes you'll wonder when you look at some of Carl Bodmer's paintings, is uh, you'll see guys wearing these off their ankles, uh, or even belts, and they were a certain warrior society, a very elite society, similar to like the Navy SEALs, um, that used the skunk, a tan skunk, pelt for a, a symbol. Um, even rawhide, and when we talked earlier about the glue, okay, if you do not take the glue out of a hide, then it gets, it's what we call rawhide. And this is a skin that you would, could look like this, but at one part during the process was stopped. And during that process, um, the hair was just removed and then it was gone, it was fleshed, and then we just left the glue in the hide. We never took it out. So it makes it really stiff. What do you do with rawhide? Well, we make baskets out of them by just taking a wet rawhide, soaking it up so it's soft, and then sewing it up, and then we fill it full of the ground corn cob that we tumble the hides in, and then let it get hard. And people like using these for trash cans, for uh, uh, wood receptacles, for fireplaces. Um, we make lampshades out of the rawhides, and they're beautiful up against the light because um, they're very translucent. So, so Wyoming, you know, the great thing about Wyoming, in particular Du Bois, is that we still maintain that Western image and lifestyle. And in, in living in Wyoming, you have a choice. You can either make a living or you can have a lifestyle. And we chose to have a lifestyle. As part of our business with tanning animal skins, we had to find a market to sell these. And one of the markets that we found was historical reenactments. People wanted these skins to, to use as props, you know, from, from the local group that's reenacting the mountain men to the film industry. They needed these skins um, to make it look as real as possible, as, as authentic as possible. So we started making costumes, and we would make um, from Indian costumes, uh, like these three shirts here. And the significance behind these particular shirts here is that all of them were in a movie called Wind River. And it was a, it was a movie shot over in Utah. Uh, and it was about a guy from Wyoming, um, Nick Wilson, who Wilson, Wyoming's named after. And, and he went to live with the Shoshones. And so when they filmed it, they called us and asked us, could we make the lead costumes for the movie? And so Russell Means uh, wore this shirt here in the movie Wind River. Uh, he, he portrayed the role of, of Warshiki, Chief Warshiki. And this Nick Wilson was his brother. He was adopted by Warshiki's mother. So we made this shirt for him. 
We made this shirt for Wes Studi, uh, who was made you know, quite famous in Dances with Wolves as a Bad Pawnee and in Last of the Mohicans. And so this was Wes Studi's shirt. And uh, we had to kind of age the different shirts a little bit to make them look like a part of the time period. Uh, we used real human hair uh, for the hair locks on it. And of course, the quill work had to be made so that it was durable. And so instead of using real quill work, we used a nylon thread and, uh, that was colored and able to make it look um, authentic. And this shirt here was worn by A. Martinez. And A. Martinez was the, uh, as a youngster, started out in the movie with John Wayne as the Cowboys um, as a young Mexican kid there. So this was A. Martinez's shirt. And we've done other films also. We work for museums to make authentic props and costumes. The most difficult thing is, from a historical standpoint, is that the film industry doesn't care about authenticity. They're there for entertainment. And so you tend to pull your hair out just a little bit when you think, well, that's not quite right, but it doesn't matter uh, as long as it looked good. And so we try to, to try and insert as much technical advice as possible, make it look as well as we can, and uh, still pacify the film industry. So another phase of our business that we've taken from the tanning with the materials that we've had is we've been able to go into um, another business, and that is working with the film and movie industry by taking the materials that we have and hopefully providing a much clearer image of history by actually having a real buffalo skin um, or a shirt that looks authentic um, because it tends to let the people know that's watching it that, yeah, that is, that could be exactly the way it was. And for us, that's part of that education process that we try and do from a business standpoint to let people know um, this is the way it should look like. This is the way the old people did it. And when we work with consulting with movies, we still try and apply the same thing. And, and when they need a scene of Indian kids playing, we make the toys that I know that they played with, that my own kids have played with, that I've made for them, um, that are authentic to that time period. So that, you know, if they're showing an 1870s film, they're not playing with, you know, something that really isn't appropriate. And so by teaching history just a little bit or putting it out there, people can form some ideas, but hopefully it's the right idea. The Brandles, Joe and Jean, Leon Sanderson, Jill Judd, and Cowboy Rob open a small window of insight into some of the folks who live in this part of Wyoming. In Thermopolis, Wyoming, at the center of the state, 1,736 gallons per minute of 127 degree water bubble up from the world's largest hot spring. That's 2.7 million gallons every 24 hours. Originally a cattle and oil community established along the banks of the Bighorn River, Thermopolis and Big Spring State Park have developed into a thermal resort which is the state's third largest attraction for tourists after Yellowstone and Grand Teton parks. There are public baths plus an entire recreational complex. Big Spring water, as it migrates down the hillside to the Bighorn River, has created elaborate and complex travertine plateaus of mineral deposits leached from the cooling water. Dinosaurs. Very large plant-eating dinosaurs roamed this region a hundred million years ago. The Thermopolis Dinosaur Center has on display more than a dozen full-size skeletons and casts. Some, including the 19-foot-long Camarasaurus, were found in the Thermopolis dig site, just 10 minutes from the museum. Others brought from as far away as China. One local Wyoming wag once described his state as a small town with really, really long streets. The vast expanse of the country's ninth largest state was defined by the coming of the railroads. Towns like Laramie thrived, prospered, and for a time epitomized the wild, wild, lawless west. Nearby Cheyenne, the state capital was another of the towns made solid by the Union Pacific's expansion west. Established in the 1860s, in 20 years it grew to a whopping 14,000 residents and was considered by many as the richest city in the world. 
The cattle business remains a significant force in Wyoming's economy. Torrington, in the eastern part of the state, is the center of this thriving Old West commerce. When it comes to selling cattle, Sean and Lex Madden, who own this and one other barn in town, are among the best auctioneers in the country. Each have won the world champion auctioneer title. A lot of cattle come through here. Uh, the reason they come down here is, is we're fortunate to have a lot of feed. We're close to uh, packing plants, a lot of feedlots in this area, a lot of cheap feed. And uh, this is kind of a market center. Uh, it's natural flow for cattle to come out of, out of the north and the west and, and go south and east to where the feed is. Cattle may be synonymous with the cowboy state, but coal is the business of Wyoming. Revenues in excess of $2 billion make Wyoming the third largest producer of coal in the world. This is the Black Thunder Coal Mine, just outside Gillette, Wyoming, the energy capital of the state. They're the largest producer of coal in the United States and most likely the world, and they do it in an ecologically sound manner. This 70-foot deep seam of coal runs for miles in all directions. Enough coal in just this seam to last well over 200 years. four-story tall electric drag line with a 185-yard bucket, that's about the size of Connecticut, uncovers the coal. Everyday business for these guys, but pretty dramatic to the casual observer. This remarkable machine is controlled by one person with a couple of joysticks and foot pedals. Once the coal seam is uncovered by the drag line, it's then blasted and shoveled into gigantic trucks in yet another spectacle of man's power over the earth. Our mission at this company is to produce the lowest cost, safest, environmentally responsible coal we can. And that's, that's kind of our mission. So People need to understand is in, in terms of generating and turning lights on and, and providing electricity in the U.S., Coal is, is one of the biggest contributors and will remain uh, regardless of our nuclear capacity is pretty well maxed right now. Uh, gas so far has been uh, a little too volatile and uh, you know, going forward from here, coal is going to be our number one electricity generator for years to come. Is it an endless supply? Uh, I wouldn't say it's endless, but over the next couple hundred years, yeah. You know, it depends on what, what time frame you want to talk. My kids certainly are going to have coal generate electricity for them. Less exciting, but equally as important, is this, the success of their restoration process. A few years ago, this was the coal seam. There's always a price to be paid for any energy source, but this is the 21st century, and without coal, it's likely our lives wouldn't be nearly as comfortable as they are now. Wyoming's impressive collection of firsts include Devil's Tower in the northeastern part of the state. The Black Hills and Devil's Tower have for centuries served both economic and sacred uses. Specifically identified in the oral history of many Plains tribes as Bear Lodge, the Devil's Tower sobriquet gained prominence in 1906 when it became the nation's first national monument. 
Over 1,000 people climb the monolith every year. The ancient volcano is 867 feet tall, and over its recorded history since the 30s, has been scaled over 60,000 times. Buffalo Bill Cody was a larger-than-life, authentic Western hero, the Renaissance man of the West turn-of-the-century culture. The community of Cody in the northeastern part of the state is not only named after the famous showman, Indian scout, buffalo hunter, and entrepreneur, he was instrumental in forming the community that bears his name. Pride of the community, and for that matter, Wyoming, the Buffalo Bill Historical Center. In a new three-story, 300,000-square-foot complex, five internationally acclaimed museums and a research library, the largest between the Mississippi and the West Coast. Thousands upon thousands of priceless treasures relating to the art, history, and culture of the American West. The Whitney Gallery of Western Art houses an outstanding collection of masterworks of the American West, featuring Frederick Remington, Charles M. Russell, and many others. The Plains Indian Museum is one of the country's largest and most extensive collections of art and artifacts depicting the life of the Plains Indian tribes. In the Draper Museum of Natural History, a challenge to the traditional museum approach with its innovative trail of interactive exhibits of the greater Yellowstone area. The Cody Firearms Museum is the world's largest collection of American and European firepower dating back to the 16th century. The oldest and original fixture of the center, a museum dedicated to the life of Buffalo Bill. Articles, artifacts, photos, and possessions of this local hero help all gain a better understanding of the life of this remarkable man. Buffalo Bill really was quite a man. I like to call him a prairie renaissance man. He started out as a, as a Teamsters helper, um, some believe he rode for the Pony Express. He was a, an army scout, or I should say a civilian scout for the Frontier Army. Um, he acted on the stage. He was a buffalo hunter. He was a hunting guide. Um, I could go on, but mostly people remember him as being a showman uh, in bringing the Wild West and all the characters associated with that, the cowboys and the Indians and people who rode horses and sharpshooters and all these other folks. And he brought them to uh, audiences in the East and audiences that might not otherwise have contact with folks like this and he took this vision of the United States over to Europe and showed Europeans what the West was like and now when you go to Europe and you say United States the first thing you think of is cowboy and West and that's why. Perhaps the best way to close out this chapter of the Discoveries America Odyssey is with the first stanza of Wyoming's state song. In the far and mighty west, where the crimson sun seeks rest, there's a growing splendid state that lies above. On the breast of this great land, where the massive Rockies stand, there's Wyoming, young and strong, the state I love.